Welcome to our special Friday episode of the Dispatch Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Isger, joined by Steve Hayes. This podcast is brought to you by The Dispatch. Visit thedispatch.com to see our full slate of newsletters and podcasts. And join us after each of the debates this month for our Dispatch Live, especially for members. Still a few days left in our free trial. It's thedispatch.com slash 30 days free, and we hope you'll try us out. We'll hear a little later from our sponsor today, ExpressVPN. But today we're joined by Dr. Jonathan Reiner. He is a professor of medical surgery at George Washington University, where he has been on the faculty since he finished training in 1994. He spends most of his time fixing hearts. He is the cardiologist for Vice President Dick Cheney and was a consultant to the White House Medical Unit while he was vice president. He is the author of the book, Heart, an American Medical Odyssey. He joins us to talk about the latest news the president and first lady have tested positive for COVID-19. And let's dive right in with Dr. Reiner. Doctor, I want to get to how you became a medical consultant to the White House and your time with Vice President Cheney. But first, let's start with what is happening at the White House right now in terms of medical protocols? Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of scrambling, maybe even a lot of chaos at the White House right now. Uh, So, you know, to to say this simply, there's virus inside the wire, to to borrow a a military uh, term. The, the White House has tried to, to protect the president by testing everybody in sight, by in, basically enveloping him in this uh, cocoon of, of rapid uh, tests, uh, which are by their very nature imperfect. And someone close to the president has tested positive, and uh, that person has traveled with the president, that person has met with people throughout the executive branch, and now apparently legislative branch, and maybe even judicial branch. So what the White House is scrambling to do is to do contact tracing. So what we're seeing really is a microcosm of the pandemic as a whole, right? We're seeing an infection spread, and we're seeing uh, health officials trying to, to track down everyone who might have been exposed exposed to the virus, what they should be doing is getting everyone who has potentially been exposed to anyone now known to be positive to quarantine. And then eventually they'll start testing people probably at multiple time points. But if you think about the universe of people that encounter the president or encounter the people that the president encounters, it's vast. And this is, this is sort of the night, the nightmare scenario, um, which is largely avoidable, which, yeah, which is, is sadly largely, of, largely avoidable. Yeah. Was this a failure of testing? No, it's, it's, it's a failure of common sense, right? It's a failure of masking. So, so I spend most of my time working in a hospital, right? working in a hospital in downtown DC, six uh, blocks from the White House. And when I go to work, I park in a lot across the street as soon as I open the door to my car, I, I put a mask on and I walk into the hospital. You can't walk into my hospital without a mask on. Uh, actually, these days, you can't work in the hospital unless you also have eye protection on. So every employee, every, every staff member, every physician, every nurse is wearing a mask and eye protection all day long. doesn't matter if I'm in the presence of a patient or not. If I'm in the presence of anyone, I'm wearing a mask. And, and we do this for two reasons. We do this to, to certainly to protect ourselves, but we also do it to protect each other because you know, we've known really since the beginning of this pandemic that there was a substantial amount of asymptomatic, car- uh, 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 asymptomatic carriers of this virus. Um, the uh, White House learned this probably at the end of January, that there, were, that there was asymptomatic community spread of this virus. So because you can't rely on somebody basically being sick, being, being febrile, having a fever or, or sneezing or coughing or having any of the classic symptoms that some patients have, 
um, you have to use what we learned in the early days of, of uh, AIDS HIV, which was universal precautions. So in the hospital, we adopted universal precautions. Everyone wears a mask all the time. And if you look at multiple studies of hospitals, what you find something very interesting. You find that the incidence of COVID-19 is lower in the hospital than it is in the community as a whole. You'd, you'd think that that's sort of counterintuitive. How can it be lower in a place wh where you're caring for patients with the disease, but it has to do with universal mask precautions. So what the White House needed to be doing from the beginning was, first of all, limiting the universe of people that, in, that interact with the, the principles. Um, as opposed to what we saw at the beginning, which were these task force meetings where the president would line up behind him, you know, all these titans of, in, uh, of uh, industry, introduce everybody, everyone would come to the same podium and grab, and grab the same mic and adjust the same mic. Um, I mean, it was horrifying, you know, for, for those of us who, who know how viruses are spread, and it's not that complicated. Uh, it was horrifying to see all these people in close proximity to the, to the president. I thought it was um, really malpractice uh, to, for the White House to allow so many people so close to the president. Uh, but it, it suited their, their narrative, which was, there's nothing to see, move along. And, you know, we're, this, is, this is all going to go away. So they had all these people come by the White House. But what they should have been doing is limiting access to the president. Um, they should have been doing a lot of their meetings through secure video link, which they have a prodigious capacity. And uh, everyone who worked in the White House, every single person who worked in the White House should have been wearing a mask at all times. And if, if you've ever visited the West Wing um, or the uh, Eisenhower uh, old executive office building next door, you know, the hallways are teeming with people. So everyone in that environment should have been wearing a mask. And what we heard this week is that that was the instinct of the NSC to get everyone masked up. But it was discouraged by the, by the president's team because they didn't like the look. Steve, I want to just read to you um, a brief section of an article in the Washington Post this morning. We've talked about how things that the White House might have done to to better protect the president. I'm interested in looking at something that the president might have done to better protect others. The passage reads: After White House officials learned of Hope Hicks' symptoms, Trump and his entourage flew Thursday to New Jersey, where he attended a fundraiser at his golf club in Bedminster and delivered a speech. Trump was in close contact with dozens of other people, including campaign supporters at a roundtable event. The president did not wear a mask Thursday, including at events at his golf course and on the plane, officials said. So this is after he knows he's been directly exposed. And potentially, we don't know exactly when the initial positive tests came in. One assumes that the president was probably tested pretty soon after Hope Hicks was um, was determined to be a positive. What's your reaction to that passage? Well, it's totally on brand. Look, what, what we've seen throughout the pandemic, and certainly over the last several months, is a willingness of the president and his team to expose his supporters to peril. Right? We saw this in Tulsa, where he did an uh, indoor event uh, that's the event that was attended by by Mr. Kane. Uh, he, he's done, um, you know, multiple indoor events, a lot of outdoor. By events. Mr. Kane, you're referring to Herman Kane, who Herman then passed Kane, away from who, who coronavirus. Who passed away? Now, you know, we'll never know whether he contracted the virus at that event or not. But the timing works. You know, he got sick about a week to ten days later, and it's you know the the, the chronology certainly. Uh, feasible, um, maybe even probable that he acquired the virus there. It was a super spreader event. Tulsa at the time had a very high uh, community positivity rate for the virus, but yet the president held an event there. Now he, the president was disappointed in the turnout, but there were still thousands of people in that arena. You can't bring thousands of people 
unmasked shoulder to shoulder together without transmitting the virus. So, but we've seen this over and over again, this really blatant disregard for the public. But, you know, if I was a supporter of the president and he was holding an event and the president has been playing down the risks anyway, the president has been wearing a mask. And the president continuously tells me that this is about to go away. And he was holding an event. I might say he wouldn't hold an event if it wasn't safe, right? That's That's sort of the benevolent kind of explanation. Why would he hold an event if it wasn't safe? But he was holding events that weren't safe, that weren't safe for the attendees. Now, the White House tried to protect him as as best they could, you know, with a double layer of barriers so that he was never, you know, more than, you know, really many feet away fr- from the attendees, even though on television, it looks like the supporters are, are able to basically scratch his back. They're, they're really quite a distance away from him. And, you know, the president has not been on a rope line since, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic. He doesn't approach any of the, uh, any of the supporters. Uh, so he's relatively safe or had been relatively safe, but there wasn't really much attention or concern, apparently, about all the people that would come. So you mentioned contact tracing uh, and what's being done now just to contain what's going on. Assuming uh, that that is completed, what would you suggest that they do now, moving forward, to protect everyone who works at the White House to continue you know, to have a functioning government? So everybody that's been in contact with with the president or Hope Hicks, um, or now apparently also uh, Ms. McDaniel, the RNC, Correct. the RNC, RNC chairwoman, chairwoman has now tested positive. See, we, we don't know who the index patient is here, mm-hmm. right? So yesterday, right. initially, we thought, well, perhaps you know Hope Hicks is the index patient, but apparently not. Apparently. Um, uh, Ron McDaniel and Hope Hicks worked together, I think, on maybe Friday of last week. Uh, but we don't know who the, we don't know who the index patient is, and we don't know who all we don't know the, again the 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 entire um, uh, extent of of infection now. But everybody who has at least been a has spent any time in close contact with. Any of those three people in the last, really, 10 days to two weeks needs, needs to quarantine. Quarantine first. Testing is not a replacement for quarantining. At some point, uh, the people who have been exposed will be tested, but what they need to do now for public health and also to protect the continuity of this government is they need not to come to work. They need to be home quarantining and then probably sometime next week get a test to see where they are. But what about the idea of herd immunity? Right. It's uh, you know this is this is a, this is irony slapping us all in the face. So herd immunity really is an, an elusive goal of that we wouldn't really come close to until most people think 60 to 70 percent of the population has been infected with the virus. A herd immunity with with the coronavirus would come with probably one to two million Americans dead. Uh, If you do if you do the do the math, if uh, 60 to 70 percent of Americans contract the virus, that's uh, at least 200 million people getting the virus. And if you use the most optimistic case fatality rates, and of course, we don't know what the true case fatality rates are because we don't know the denominator, right? We only know the numerator. We don't, we don't, we haven't tested nearly uh, a, a, a large enough proportion in this country to know what the true incidence of the virus is. But even using the most optimistic scenarios, if the mortality rate, the case fatality rate, was only 0.5%, and I say only in quotation marks because that would be about five times the mortality risk for the annual flu, which kills a lot of people in this country, and you infected 200 million people, that's a million deaths, right? And I think the mortality rate might be a bit higher than that. So it's, and no one knows if 
uh, the uh, immunity that you acquire after being infected is durable. We don't know how long that lasts. It, it certainly lasts for a period of time, but you know, it's this is not necessarily a uh, and probably not likely a lifelong immunity. So it's it's nonsense. It's been it's been debunked by everybody except the principal advisor to the president now, uh, Scott Atlas. Can I uh, give you a statement from the president's doctor? As as you and I were corresponding into the wee hours of the morning, we first had mm-hmm. a tweet from the president acknowledging that he had tested positive along with the first lady. And then we got a statement from the president's doctor, and it was a short statement, but the, the line that sort of leapt off the page to me was the following. I expect the president to continue carrying out his duties without disruptions while recovering. Do you expect that? Well, I hope that. Um, I really do hope that. But it's unpredictable. So s- some people have, some people, as we said, are asymptomatic. Some people have sort of m- mild or moderate and tolerable symptoms. And some people get really sick. And the time course is typically a- after someone tests positive, it takes about a week for someone to get sick enough that they need to be hospitalized, about a week out. And then for hospitalized patients, it takes about another week for the wheels really to come off. So I, you know, right now the president may feel well enough to work and, and that's great. And that, I hope that continues and, and, it, and maybe it probably will. But it, look at the experience of the uh, British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who had the virus uh, several months ago. He's almost 20 years younger than the president. And he's also a man of, of, of higher body weight, but almost 20 years younger. And they almost needed to intubate him. He was in the ICU not doing the duties of, of state. He had, I think, relinquished temporarily the day-to-day management of, of, of the government uh, to his deputy because he was in no, no capacity. Think of it this way. The patients who get into trouble, many of them get into trouble, or maybe even most of them get into trouble as a consequence of respiratory compromise, and they need increasing amounts of oxygen. Well, you know, if you've ever seen somebody in respiratory distress or on high flow oxygen, that's not somebody who's, you know, reviewing briefing reports or meeting with CIA briefers, right? Those people struggle. So, you know, I, I expect that the president probably will recover because most patients do, even people in his age group and even people with his comorbid, comorbidities, but he does not have an insignificant risk of something bad happening. You know, a 74-year-old man, morbidly obese, probably has a 10% risk of dying from this. So I think you speak for all of us when you say that you hope he recovers uh, and recovers right. quickly and does not have uh, tremendous right. symptoms. The reality is there's a lot of government planning that goes into a situation just like this. And, you know, I know from from writing a biography of, of Dick Cheney and, you know, from working alongside mm-hmm. him for so many years that this was something of an obsession of of Dick Cheney's was this yeah. cont- continuity of government participated in these exercises Cheney did going back to the Ford years. If if you are uh, in the White House working on the medical team, <clears throat> at what point do you? What's your advice? I mean, if the president does have these, is in respiratory distress, just as as you describe. At what point do you feel like you have to make a determination about whether he's able to carry out his responsibilities as president? And how does that work? I mean, just in, in you know, for in lay language, what, how does that work? I mean, do you, yeah. would, would the medical professionals make a recommendation to the vice president? Would they make a recommendation to the president? Can you walk us through how that might unfold? Yeah, so, th- so, so the 25th Amendment um, most people think the 25th Amendment came about after Kennedy's assassination, but it, it did in terms of timing. It really came out as a consequence of Eisenhower's near fatal heart attack in the 1950s, where he was out of Washington and out of commission for months. Um, but 
And it, and it provides this pathway for a majority of the essentially cabinet secretaries to determine if the president is no longer fit for office or for the president to voluntarily, temporarily, or permanently relinquish duties of, of office. But some of that, rec- but, but as you correctly uh, state, it requires someone to make the determination that the president is, is not f- medically fit for duty. So who would that be? Well, you know, in the case of George W. Bush, when he had colonoscopy, he just basically signed the paper and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some propofol for the next half hour. So um, temporarily ceding control of the government to the vice president. But what happens if the president doesn't do that voluntarily? Who is responsible for doing that? So the cabinet doesn't have the medical capacity by themselves to make these determinations. So they would uh, defer to the White House Medical Unit. Now, the White House Medical Unit is staffed by career army officers. I've worked with these people um, throughout the years. They're the best of the best. They're, they're fabulous people. They're patriots. They do a very hard job. They travel millions of miles a year away from their family. Uh, but they are subordinate officers to the president. So it would take a very mature, confident officer to say to the president of the United States, sir, I don't think you're fit for duty right now. I think you should consider the 25th Amendment. Imagine, now, imagine that conversation with this particular patient. Uh, back in um, 2001, uh, I sat in the then vice president's uh, hospital room, and I said to him that, and I didn't work for him. I was a civilian, right? I was his physician, but I wasn't an officer that whose career could be derailed or I could be immediately removed. I said to him that if I ever thought he was not fit for duty, he wouldn't have to ask me. I would tell him. And I hope there's somebody in the White House medical unit who feels the same way. The, you know, the, the willingness and to, to speak that kind of truth to power you know, re- requires a lot, of, you know, a lot of confidence. And I hope, I hope that, that someone there has that. Now, I'll tell you, I have some concerns about the White House physicians because they spend a lot of time with the president. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if the president's physician, Sean Conley, has been exposed to the virus. Because if he's been exposed to the president in the last several days, then he needs to quarantine. So I have a real yeah. just nuts and bolts question on that, by the way. Uh, you know, for instance, if Steve, our head of dispatch state, gets <laughs> sick, his doctor can't then come tell me, uh, Sarah, you know, Steve is too sick. It's time for you to take the helm of the dispatch podcast uh, because there's all sorts of rules about the, you know, violation. I mean, of that would and be, else. that would be sort of an Al Haig moment. Let's be honest. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, everyone. I'm in charge, in charge there. is what I would put in the Slack channel. Um, <laughs> Steve, you know, I would, <laughs> uh, can the, the president's doctor, if he cannot say that to the president, say that to Mike Pence. The 25th Amendment, of course, talks about a majority of the principal officers of the executive departments, but even a majority of them cannot act without the vice president as well. It is always the vice president plus. And so can that doctor go to the vice president and say, uh, you know, the president isn't receptive to this information, but I need to tell you, Mr. Vice President, that in my medical opinion, the president is not fit for duty. And I would hope he or she would do that. And they're allowed to do that. Um, it's an interesting point in terms of, in terms of HIPAA. It, it's, it's a, it's a fat, it's a fascinating question. I would hope that they would do that because the, mm-hmm. the, the stakes are greater than one person, right? Now, HIPAA is designed to protect the privacy of, of, of a single person. But in this case, we're trying to protect the welfare of an entire nation or maybe even the planet. So, um, you know, the constitution has another provision which no one speaks about, but the, the, the sentence that follows the one that you basically paraphrased also says, or some other body that the Congress may provide. So the Constitution actually envisioned a circumstance where Congress would decide whether the president had a fitness for office. I'm now, I'm not sure Ooh, how This that is would... where we get into fun 
legal things because it says uh, another body as Congress may by law provide, which means they would have needed to pass a law over the president's presuming then the president is uh, not able to sign that law. They would need to pass it over his pocket veto at that point. Pretty difficult. And interesting. Especially with this Congress, right? Right. <laughs> Congress as, Correct. as mean, currently it, constituted. 30 days. This Congress getting a majority days on anything, an let election. alone a super majority. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, can I ask one more medical question? Then I think we, Sarah and I are both very interested in talking to you about the, the implications um, of the virus on, on the hard. Um, the reports out this morning, we're recording this Friday mid-morning. Um, the reports out this morning that the president is experiencing mild symptoms. Is that something that should be encouraging to us that he's only experiencing mild symptoms or is it the case that mild symptoms would be sort of the logical um, precursor to more severe symptoms? It's hard to know. Okay. It's, re it's really hard to know whether, um, first of all, I have to say it's hard to know what the truth is. It's, it's really hard. It's really hard to know whether the president really only has mild symptoms. I think the only thing that we can say is that if if it's been reported that he has mild symptoms, we know he's symptomatic. Right. Right. So we know that he's not asymptomatic. Right. So so we, we can we can cross that off. So now that we know he's symptomatic, but I don't think we really understand how symptomatic he is. You know, I thought last night as as the, all of this was breaking that it would be incredibly important for the president to address the, the nation, you know, from the residents and, and basically say, look, I'm okay. You know, I feel achy. I have a little bit of a scratchy throat. I'm going to hunker down. I'm, I'm sure I'll be okay. I'll be in touch with you throughout the week and, you know, next couple of weeks, but we'll get through this and with your prayers, et cetera. Uh, and, but Dr. Reiner, he called into Hannity last night. Isn't that the same thing? Yeah, yeah almost. <laughs> That's almost, particularly the prayer <laughs> portion. But but the but to reassure the public that he's that he's okay, um, and maybe even to to do something bigger than than himself and say, you know, I haven't been forceful enough with you about masks, and if there's anything we can learn as a country now, is you got to mask up because that would be this enormous positive outcome of this really horrible moment where the president and first lady get sick. Now the president comes out and encourages the entire country to wear a mask. That would have this spectacular benefit in terms of public health. And so, you know, be, you know, turn yeah. turn what looks like fiasco in, you know, in, into, into, into something, into something positive. And if I were his people, that's what I would be advocating. Um, I mean, it's the obvious, it's the obvious thing to do, but in order to do that, you have to be willing to say, you know, I wasn't right about this. I mean, that's a, that, that's a, a, a human attribute to be able to admit that you've been wrong about something, a very personal attribute. We've never seen that from this man. And, and, you know, far be it. I mean, I'm a doctor, so no one really cares what I think about politics. But if I were a political advisor, what a boost he would get from that, showing a little bit of humanity, showing a little bit of, of humbleness about, about not being right about everything. Well, it could make him a more, I mean, certainly I think from a political perspective, it could make him a more sympathetic figure in this, in this right. moment. Uh, what does it mean for the rest of us? I've taken three COVID tests so far since the virus outbreak. By the way, all of them pretty unpleasant. Yeah. Then you had the right <laughs> test. If they like were a... unpleasant, you had a good test. <laughs> if... Yeah, I mean, ugh, the one I had, I uh, gave birth this summer to my first child. And the one that they did before that to enter a hospital was, I think they, you know, <laughs> to to quote that uh, the quote that Reagan used um, slipped the bonds of earth to touch my brain. <laughs> right, like, <laughs> it's all like a brain biopsy. That's that's the way it should. Oh feel. God, it was it was awful. Right. Um, but the fact that this is such a lagging indicator, and yet businesses are using these tests to determine whether people can come back to work and work together, um, should 
that not be the case? Should we not be pe- sending people back to work and saying, yeah, but we're testing everyone before they come in? Or that plus masks, you think, in your medical opinion, is an acceptable way to start reopening the economy? What would you do now that you know the people who are testing the most in the entire world, probably, the White House bubble, as you said, the virus got inside the wire, even with all that testing, mind you, without masks? Oh, we need a massive increase in testing. Um, and w- we need to use these rapid antigen tests, some of these paper tests, they're called lateral assay tests, um, where, which can be done at home for a buck maybe. And you know, they, these tests haven't yet come to the market. We're seeing the first one, the, Abbott, the new Abbott test, which the government bought the entire allotment of 150 million tests. But that's the trick to opening the economy. That's the trick to getting kids back to school. If you, if every household had a supply of these tests, and there many of these are now configured with an app that lets you sort of scan the result and you get like a green or a red QR code on your, on your phone, and that's how you walk into your office building in the morning. That's how you walk into the school in the morning. We have tens or hundreds of millions of tests a day. We start testing like like crazy. That's how you open the economy. The, they these tests have have not yet hit the market because the FDA has been concerned about their sensitivity, whether they're sensitive enough. But the way to think about these tests, these these slightly less sensitive, but much more readily available tests, is that it would be the equivalent of casting a gigantic fishnet, which has which has greater spaces be- between the fibers of the net so that relatively more fish get through the net but since the net is so gigantic, you catch many, many more fish. So you don't worry about, about the occasional f- fish getting through the net because you're catching so many more fish. And that's what these, these antigen tests will do. We need to start doing that. And yeah, and we need to be a mass culture. Un- until we have a herd immunity uh, from a-, a vaccine, and I feel good about a vaccine going forward, uh, yeah, for the next couple of years, you're going to be wearing a mask in public. You know, we just have to get used to that. The if if you've ever uh, traveled through Asia, it's been part of that culture for a long time. People walk around in the streets all the time with masks. The only people not wearing masks in the street are Westerners. So it, it's no big deal. Put a mask on. That's that's your ticket to getting back into a movie theater or getting back into school or getting or getting. Um, you know, uh, kids back in, in, into, uh, into sports. It's not a big deal. And, but we, we politicized it, but that's the path forward. So, you know, perhaps there's an opportunity in this crisis to take that and to get more of the country to wear masks, right. To, to, to stop this red blue split when it comes to, to wearing masks. It's, it's, it's nonsense. We need to move beyond that. We're smarter than that. We had Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Romer on yeah. months and months and months ago laying out his plan for mass testing. And he made substantially the same case that, that you're making. And I've thought about that interview quite a bit since then, because you think if we had done that then, where would we be now? And I think the question um, answers itself. Before before we let you go, I, I'm eager to to understand better what you've learned as a cardiologist ab- about how the virus affects the heart. Um, and, you know, among the more fascinating things I've read about the virus itself and, and kind of the mysteries that it's, that it's given us uh, relates to blood clotting and circulation. And it's particularly it, uh, of interest to me because I have a blood clotting disorder. Um, but you've read stories about, uh, you know, doctors operating on an aneurysm on a, on a blood clot in the brain and literally in real time watching as another aneurysm uh, happens, uh, which is, you know, not certainly not common. And you, you, you read about thousands of, of clots in the lungs. Yeah. What, 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 what have we learned about this since we first uh, encountered the virus, you know, now 10 months ago? So first of all, you know, the public is getting to see um, medicine and science learn about a disease in real time. This has never happened before. I mean, the, well, the last time this has happened was uh, with um, HIV AIDS in the early 1980s, uh, 
basically before I started medical school. But that was before the internet era allowed the public to, to basically get this data in real time. So what we know is that this is a respiratory pathogen. It infects the lungs, but it also affects the blood vessels. And it affects the blood vessels in a way that does promote clotting. And there is some data that suggests that patients who are sick with COVID do better if they're anticoagulated, mm-hmm. right? If, they're, if their blood is thinned. We know, we know the virus can affect the heart either directly or as a consequence of a over-robust immune response. Um, we know that to, to treat that over, uh, sort of exuberant immune response, steroids seem to be beneficial. That that's one of the therapeutics that does appear to make a difference in patients. If, if given early enough, high doses of steroids, um, if you do cardiac magnetic resonance, resonance, uh, tests, cardiac MR tests on people, you see a lot of these little scars on the heart, um, so people, you know, this concern been raised about whether, you know, the virus has been damaging hearts. I think some of that is overplayed. And actually, if you, if you scan people who have been hospitalized with influenza, you can find the same kind of small scars on, mm. on the heart. So I'm not sure how clinically meaningful it's going to be in most people. This is one of the reasons why some of the college football conferences closed down for fear that these elite athletes would, would take a hit to their heart and no longer be elite athletes. I think that concern is probably over, overplayed. But we're learning. We're learning about it. And it's a humbling disease. Um, and um, we'll continue to know more. I think, I think that as we go forward, we're very likely to have multiple vaccines that work. And then we're going to have, and that's going to be an incredible logistic challenge to get vaccines out to the public, um, particularly the RNA vaccines, which require ultra cold transport and storage. Uh, and then, you know, all kinds of interesting philosophical and ethical issues related to who gets vaccinated first and how we do it. Um, but we'll do it. Uh, but the there are a lot of challenges. We've never vaccinated more than 60% of, in a given year. We've never vaccinated more than about 60% of the public for influenza. And we want to vaccinate basically everybody you know, for this. We certainly want to vaccinate 70 to 80% of the public uh, for uh, COVID-19. So, so we're not turning the corner. The, the way I like to, d- to describe this is, this isn't the beginning of the end, but it, it probably is the end of the beginning now. What are you telling a patient like Vice President Cheney, someone with obviously a uh, heart condition, uh, older American? Can Are you telling him that as long as he's wearing a mask, he's okay to go out most places? Are you saying as long as he's outdoors, it's okay? Or are you telling him you should really be staying uh, at home and not seeing people? Yeah, I've been telling... I, well, I'll, I'll tell you what I tell most people his... Patients uh, like I'll him. I'll tell you, right, yes. most people his age. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I tell I tell them that they need to they need to minimize their viral footprint. Right? I don't tell people they need to be a hermit necessarily, but I tell them that uh, you know if they don't get their groceries with uh, and uh, with, with via some some app and they go they go to a grocery store, go to the grocery store once a week. Don't go every day, you know, just sort of to to buy you know to 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 pass the time. Don't go in, you know, every day for one or two items. Go once a week. Go early in the morning when when the store is empty. Make sure you have a mask on. Uh, make sure you have gel with, with you to sanitize your hands after you touch the card, or even wear gloves. Uh, and distance from people. Um, you really want to decrease your footprint. Don't go into a crowded place. Um, don't don't be near people who aren't wearing masks. Lower your if if you wear a mask, and you socially distance, you will not get this virus. This is a primarily uh, respiratory transmitted virus. If you wear a mask, and you keep your distance, you'll be fine. Um, that's what I tell people. I want them to go out and get exercise. Go for a walk. Go go for a jog if you can do that. Uh, wear a mask, uh, and 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 you'll be fine. One of the Biggest mistakes made, besides, 
uh, you know, everything. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes <laughs> made was telling the public that masks were really only to protect, you know, your neighbors, that this was an altruistic thing we're, we were going to do. I mean, I'm sad to say that in America that that didn't resonate, right? What we needed to say, because it was true, was that the mask will keep you from getting the virus. Then I think the uptake would have been more, more robust. Uh, it didn't work so, so well when we simply said, you know, you're trying to protect the old guy next door from dying from this. We needed to, to, tell, the people, to tell the public that wearing a mask will prevent you from dying of this virus. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsor today, ExpressVPN. When you use the bathroom, you always close the door behind you, right? You don't want random passers-by looking in on you. So why would you let people look in on you when you go online? Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like going to the bathroom and not closing the door. Do you know that your internet service provider like Comcast or Verizon knows every single website you visit. And what's worse is they can sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who will use your data to target you. ExpressVPN puts a stop to this. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that your online activity can't be seen by anyone. You can use ExpressVPN on all your devices. It works on everything, phones, laptops, even routers. So everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can still be protected even if they don't have ExpressVPN. And the best part is using ExpressVPN is as easy as closing the bathroom door. You just fire up the app, click one button, and you're protected. ExpressVPN is the world's number one rated VPN by CNET, Wired, The Verge, and countless others. So if you believe your online activity is your business, secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com slash freedom today. Use my exclusive link, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash freedom, and you can get an extra three months free. That's expressvpn dot com slash freedom. Okay, last question. We try to ask something fun, but I want it to be on brand, <laughs> and I'm going to ask it to Steve as well. Um, obviously, you want to emphasize masks, and masks are becoming quite the item to pick up. You can you can get any number of masks online in every store you walk into. Do you, Dr. Reiner, have a fashion mask, <laughs> you know, a non-medical looking or black mask? Uh, I don't. I, <gasps> I don't have a fashion mask. I have because, because of, uh, I, I have a mask that was given to me by a plumber who I take care of. So when I wear it, I, I'm, you know, I wear his brand on my face. So it, it, I'm wearing his, his oh, plumbing. Oh, that's kind of, that's a fashion mask of but sorts. But I don't have like a RBG mask or a Fauci mask. <laughs> I've thought about that. Um, but no, no, I don't. I, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I, the, the, best, the best masks uh, to wear, frankly, are, uh, are cotton, or are the, you know, more formal surgical masks. The, you know, the bandana, uh, you know, it, it, there's actually a gradient of efficacy. So while... Um, I'd like to wear like an American flag bandana around, you know, or skull and crossbones and look like a true bandit. Um, <laughs> those are two very different fashion masks you're describing. I know, I know, I know. Uh, but I, I, I you know, I, I'm a doc, so I, I try and wear something that's going to protect me and, and protect other people. Um, and these should be readily, they should be basically free. There, there should be, there should be kiosks on the street where you can just pull a mask. And, 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 and put one on. Maybe we should start doing that in big cities. You go into the metro, you go into the New York City subway, you just take a mask out of the kiosk. Well, at one point, the, the Postal Service was going to deliver masks for free to households across the country. And that plan was scuttled, uh, I believe, back in That was April a gigantic or, failure. Or yeah. They were going to send five masks to every household in April. Yeah. Would and the been. White House didn't like the look of, of doing that. That probably cost 100,000 lives that decision. Wow. So my, uh, my suggestion to you, if I can make one would be you, you could do sort of a meta mask and you could have a mask with a picture that Liz Cheney tweeted out with the vice president wearing a mask saying real men wear masks on your mask. And it would be sort of <laughs> meta meta. Um, I have, uh, I have a green Bay Packers mask that my sister sent me from Wisconsin. So 
Uh, that's going to be, I just got it uh, in the last couple of days. So that will be my go-to, my go-to mask. Uh, certainly as long as the Packers are continuing to win. I like that. I should get a, I should get a Yankees mask. I, I would wear a Yankees mask. There you go. That's good. That would make you pretty unpopular. If you hear that in New York, <laughs> send me a Yankees mask. <laughs> uh, I, my aunt sent me four these like very beautiful, like silk, you know, silk on the outside, like cotton in the inside, um, like flower ish, colorful masks. And I have not bought any masks. So I've just been using her four. And so when my husband does our once a week, uh, once every 10 day, once a week grocery shopping. And so I send him with one of these, but I've told him that they're Jimmy Buffett masks <laughs> instead of uh, female masks, which they obviously are. <laughs> That's awesome. Smart. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Reiner. And uh, again, the book, Amazing Heart, an American Medical Odyssey. And we'll, we'll see you out there. Thank you for all your good advice. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. 